What would you call the European Union? A hard power or a soft power? The EU likes to use the term normative power. It's an academic concept that can be translated into simple words. A normative power is a power that is confident about its norms and institutions. Europe likes to project itself in this light. It likes to think of itself as a pleasant garden where democracy and ethics thrive, where rules are respected, where everyone gets a fair chance. The reality may be quite the opposite. The European Union is grappling with a big corruption scandal. It is called Qatar Gate. European lawmakers were caught lobbying for Qatar. Never mind the human rights. And they did it th thanks to their political culture, a culture that facilitates corruption, bribery and criminal behavior at the very top. And at the core of this is unchecked lobbying. We'll tell you all about it tonight. Let's start with Qatar Gate. The scandal came to light in December last year. The Belgian police detained European lawmakers and uncovered a pile of cash worth around 1.5 million euros. Qatar Gate is basically this. European lawmakers accepted bribes from Qatar and Morocco. In return, they promoted the interests of these two Arab nations in the EU. Classic quid pro quo. Some big names have been implicated. Like Eva Kaili, she is a Greek MEP. MEP is a member of European Parliament. And what's the European Parliament? The legislature of the European Union. It has representatives from 27 EU nations, some 700 representatives or MEPs. As days passed, it became quite clear that Eva Kaili was just one piece of the Qatar Gate puzzle. The mastermind was this man, Antonio Panzeri, a former Italian MEP. He is admitted to his role. He funneled cash to European parliamentarians. There's another man who's in the dock. His name is Luca Vicentini. He was the general secretary of the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation. It is the world's largest trade union federation. He was detained by police and dumped by the trade union. This scandal has shaken the European Union, forced it to take some decisions. You see, the lobbying was not new or unique and its pitfalls were clear to everyone. The writing was on the wall, but the EU was reluctant to act. This scandal has forced it to change. The European Parliament is set to regulate lobbying. Former members will be barred from lobbying at least for six months after leaving office. It may help, but not very much. The current system is this. Former lawmakers are given a free pass to access the European Parliament, and they openly lobby on behalf of various interest groups. The new rules will regulate this access. It's not a foolproof mechanism, but it's a start. And here's the larger issue. Lobbying is a crucial part of policy making in the EU. It's an att attractive career option, especially for former lawmakers. For starters, it pays really well. In Europe, the lines between lobbying and corruption are very blurred. Technically, all the people accused in the Qatar Gate scandal were lobbying too. But they were doing so at the behest of Qatar and Morocco after accepting bribes, both in cash and in kind. 12,000 organizations are registered with the bloc's voluntary EU lobby register. The key word here is voluntary. So organizations can choose not to register and still carry out lobbying. Do you know how much money is spent on lobbying every year in the EU? 1.8 billion euros. And here's the catch. This is just the spending that is voluntarily declared. So there's a lot of money that is not declared. A report was published a week before Qatar Gate broke out. It was an analysis of 28,000 lobbying meetings involving European lawmakers. 28,000 meetings in three years, from 2019 to 2022. And these were just the meetings they chose to disclose. How many lawmakers disclosed their meetings? A little more than half of them. What about the rest? There's no telling what they were up to. And do you know what's the most startling loophole? Third countries are exempted from the EU's transparency rules. What are third countries? Countries that are not part of the European Union, non-EU members. They don't have to register in the EU's lobby register, which in any case is voluntary. Long story short, it's easy to be corrupt in this bloc. It's also legal in a lot of cases. And it shows that the EU has a lot of work to do before it tries to set the norms and examples for the rest of the world. Our last story is about a Japanese lawmaker who has made history, but not in a good way. 
We're talking about a man called Yoshikazu Higashitani, also known as Gashi on YouTube. He's a celebrity gossip YouTuber turned member of parliament, and he's Japan's first lawmaker to be kicked out of parliament without ever entering it. Simply put, the parliament's discipline committee has stripped him of his status. He's been expelled by his colleagues for never coming to work. And we don't exaggerate when we say never. This man was elected to office about seven months ago. And since then, he hasn't attended a single day of parliament sessions. He's been called a no-show MP. And why was he a no-show? He was scared of being arrested over fraud allegations and defamation claims from celebrities. Last week, he was asked for an in-person apology in the chamber. He was absent for that too. What do you think would happen if you did not show up for work for a week, let alone seven months? Will you be let off the hook if you suddenly went AWOL, absent without leave? We don't think so. So why are the rules so different for those who govern us? MPs across the world have poor attendance in parliaments. India's case is dismal. According to last year's data, only 25% of Lok Sabha or lower house MPs had more than 90% attendance. 3% MPs had less than 35%. India's Rajya Sabha or upper house has an average attendance of 78%, with only 14% members with full attendance. What about Indian celebrities who entered the parliament? The situation gets worse. They often fail to speak for the common man in real life. Their attendance goes as low as about 20%. They rarely participate in debates and sometimes ask only one question in over three years in parliament. In the UK last year, ministers were even accused of trying to cover up their attendance. The poor attendance of parliamentarians has been flagged many times. So why don't they attend the sessions? Sometimes they show up only when they've been allocated time to speak. The parliamentary speaker in Sri Lanka, for, for instance, bemoaned this last year. Other times, meetings are adjourned without completing its business, usually because of insufficient number of MPs or chaos. Now, remember, expulsion is the most severe punishment for a lawmaker. In Japan, it has happened only twice since 1950. And this is the first time it has happened due to continued absence. In Canada, a senator cannot miss two consecutive sessions. In India, one can lose their seat after 60 days of continuous absenteeism. But that's the thing, continuous. Government whips find it difficult to get a decent presence of MPs. But it doesn't do much to help the empty seats in parliaments. Like in India last year, there were random checks in parliamentary meetings. The year before that, India held its first ever quantitative analysis of attendance in Rajya Sabha. Last year, Uganda's parliament decided to monitor attendance registers. What else can be done to rein in absenteeism? Maybe a minimum attendance criterion. Maybe incentivizing MPs can also help, especially when important discussions are taking place. Last year, a Malaysian lawmaker raked up a storm. He was criticized for his low attendance, so he said... Parliament attendance is not the same as school. Sure, attendance is mandatory in most institutions like schools and colleges. And this is where one gives their own money and complies with such regulations. But what happens when you earn from the public's money? Do you not owe them full attendance in the parliament at the very least? Higher participation is essential for the working of parliaments. It acts as a backbone for scrutinizing laws that govern us. Only if the members show up, can the government be held accountable and responsible. It's the bare minimum. And finally, it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with Georgia. Anti-West protests have broken out. Protesters burnt the European Union flag outside the parliament. This was in reaction to anti-government protests in the same country. In Argentina, the sky has turned orange because of wildfires. The scenes look apocalyptic, to say the least. Forests are burning in Cuba as well. Meanwhile, in Russia, President Vladimir Putin took a helicopter for a spin. And finally, we have the answer to who let the dogs out. It was UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. And he got into trouble for that. We're leaving you with the visuals. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
Ante el déficit de precipitaciones en el oriente de Cuba es proclive la aparición de nuevos incendios forestales. En las últimas horas el Consejo de Defensa Provincial en Holguín ha incrementado las acciones para contener el incendio que se propaga en la zona del Prado en el Consejo de Llamas hacia la Sierra Cristal. Desde el municipio de Mayarí del vicegobernador de Santiago de Cuba. Thank you. 